Well, good morning. Hey, welcome. Uh, my name is Jeffrey. I am one of the pastors on the team, and I am honored to get to jump into our guardrail series. Uh, we we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart today. Uh, as a undiagnosed but very obvious person with ADHD, uh, that shocks everyone. I know the uh, the thought of distractions is always like on my mind, as are fifty six other things. And so I, this is one of those sermons that I get to preach out of my weakness, and those are the best. So uh, I'm going to start this morning, though, by uh, inviting one of my best friends in the world up here, Jordan Zemer. So Jordan, you can come up here. He's going to help me. Uh, I love Jordan. He has been a friend for a long time. I love him even though he is an Aggie. And uh, so in spite of his faults, I still love him. You didn't get any whoops. <laughs> That's great. That made me so happy. I mean, Rackham Tech. All right, um, somebody get, oh, I love you people. That made me so happy. That never happens. All right, so here's Jordan. Here, you're going to have to stay. I've, we messed up first service, and you're out of the camera shot right now, and everybody needs to see your pretty face. There you go. All right, there's $79. Just hold that for me. Don't go anywhere with it. 79 is an incredibly random amount of money, except for it is the general age that people, it's the general lifespan for people. 79 years is the average lifespan of a person on planet Earth today. So it's great. It feels like a lot. 79 feels like a significant amount of time that we all have until we start to spend it. So we have, did you know, 26 years of our life we will spend sleeping. 26 years. So Jordan, count off 26 and throw them on that table. 26 years of our life we'll spend sleeping. And I know if you have kids that are under the age of five, you don't believe that. And I recognize that. It's okay. They get older and their doors lock. Um, we spend seven years of our life trying to get to sleep. That feels more real. So 26 years of our life sleeping, seven years of our life trying to get to sleep. So already 33 years of our 79 years are spent doing some sort of sleeping activity. That doesn't even include naps, I don't think. So that's 33 years. Did you know we spend on average 13 years of our life working? So before we get to anything, all we've talked about, sleeping, trying to get to sleep, and work, and we've already eaten up 46 of our 79 years are already spent. We spend on average eight years of our life watching TV or movies. We spend, huh? It seems low, that's right. Four years of our life, 4.3 actually, is spent eating. 1.3 years of our life is spent going to the gym. And the fact that four years is spent eating and 1.3 years is spent going to the gym tells us a lot about our culture. Three years of our life is spent on social media, which also feels low. If you go to school from kindergarten until you get your undergraduate degree, you will spend 2.75 years of your life in school. So we'll spend going to school. Think about that. From a kindergartner to getting their undergraduate degree is less time than the average person spends on social media, which once again tells us a lot about where we're at as a society. Let's see, did I forget anything? We should have about $14 left. Thank you, Jordan. Y'all give Jordan a hand for me. Even an Aggie could count to 14. <laughs> he could at first service. He messed it up and derailed the whole thing. We start out with seven, I mean, a stack of cash. Look at this. I mean, we started out with some time. This is not an insignificant amount of time that each of us had. And yet, by just doing the things that we have to do, before we get to anything we choose, before we start talking about how we're going to do kids' activities and family vacations and, and all that that looks like, before we touch that, we've already spent this much time sleeping, going to school, going to work, watching media, and all we're left with is this. This is it. This is what I get to choose. This is how I have to spend my life. Of 79 years, I'm left with 14. This week, as I began to think about this topic, because it feels, to be honest, to be frank, talking about distraction feels shallow. It's distractions. I mean, not that big a deal until you realize that one of the greatest tactics that the enemy has is using distractions to just peel off a year here. 
using distractions to just take this part, this season that we could have chosen differently and, and waste it there. And he's convincing us that we can just spend our lives in good, but not best. See, one of the primary tools the enemy uses to, to ensure that we live our lives poorly is distraction. And we are so easily distracted. Has anyone seen the movie Up? Okay, if you haven't, don't watch it. It's soul-crushingly sad. It's a kid's movie that just makes you weep. There's a dog in Up, and every time he sees a squirrel, he freaks out and gets all off track. And we laugh at it, it's funny. That is often us. Just take social media. I mean, here's how often we spend our lives on social media. It'll be the end of the day and we're kind of tired or, you know, I just want to sit in the couch and I just want to just let me think, like let my mind rest for a little while. So we open up Instagram, we scroll through the gram, catch up. And we're like, all right, I've seen all that. I'm going to go to Facebook so I can make sure that I know what my acquaintance from 14 years ago thinks about the current political climate. And so we immediately get off Facebook because that cesspool needs to just go away. But it's almost dinner time now, and so we've got we've to find something to eat for dinner. So we flip on over to Pinterest, and, and we're looking at Pinterest. Well, after we've pinned enough DIY projects to last three lifetimes, then we're like, all right, I'll go to TikTok. Scroll through TikTok for a little while, and without thinking about it, without meaning to, we've spent an hour and a half of our life mindlessly doom scrolling through social media. That's how easily distracted we are. Here's how bad it is. TikTok, which they have one goal, right? just to have people use their app. That's their goal. They know that we are so easily distracted and we'll get stuck in a cycle of just going from video to video to video. They run ads on their own platform telling you to stop scrolling and do something else. Think about the magnitude of that. A company that is a for-profit company is telling you, stop using our app because you can't stop yourself from being distracted. I mean, it is a problem. And it is one of the most subtle tactics that the enemy uses to get us off track. Because if he can just convince us to choose good things over the best things, he gets us to just peel off our life. And distraction is often just leading us to choose good but not best. I think we see good and not best really easily shown often in marriages. So when you begin to date somebody... They're your world, right? I mean, it's like Jesus and then that person. You want to be with them. You want to talk to them. Like wherever they are, you want to be. They're eating. You want to eat with them. They're studying. You study better together, which you don't, by the way. They're having coffee. You want coffee. They're breathing. You got to breathe. Like you just want to be with each other all the time. And then if things go well and all that being together doesn't make you decide that you don't want to be together, you get engaged. And you begin to think about like big dreams. What's it going to look like when we get married and have kids and we get the minivan and the, and the doodle and like we got that whole life. And then you stand in front of your friends and family and declare that forever and always they will be your number two. It's Jesus and them. Everything else is, set, is third to them. They're the most important thing. And then life happens. And your job gets busier, more hectic, more stressful. Eventually you do have kids. And I love my kids. Kids are needy. Like every day they feel like they have to eat and go places. It's exhausting. You do stuff with your kids and then they start to get older and they have activities. And then their activities have activities. And their activities, activities have activities. And your life is spent with that one word, activities. You got the hobby car. You got the bachelorette nights. And we fill our life up. And what I see so often is you get 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And one day you look at your spouse and you're like, I'm not sure the last time you and I talked about you and I. I'm not sure the last time I asked you about your heart. I don't know what's going on in your world. We've become glorified roommates. And listen, you didn't do it on purpose, right? And all those things are good. Your job is good. Some would even say necessary. Your kids are amazing. Maybe, I don't know your kids. My kids are amazing. 
Kids are great. Their activities are fun. Relationships, they matter. But when we say this is the most important human relationship we have, it's so easy for us to fill our life up with good things, just not the best thing. And none of us does this on purpose. We all would want best. If the options are good and best, we all want best. We want a life filled with best. I want the best of everything. I want the most intimate relationship with God. I want the best marriage and the best job. I want, I want best. If God offers best over good, give me best. If he offers significance over insignificance, I want significance. I want my life to matter, and that's everyone. We are born with this innate thing inside of us that we want to matter. We want to be significant. If we don't figure out best over good, we'll never matter because all we'll do is spend our life away without ever meaning to. And what scripture tells us to do in Lamentations is this, test and examine our ways. The invitation of scripture is to look at our lives and see how are we spending it because we just don't have enough to waste. We started out with 79 years. We ended up with 14 and that's just with the basic things. We do not have enough margin to waste our lives doing menial, less than things when God offers us best. We can't settle for good. And the place I think we see this most impactful maybe in Scripture is in the book of Ephesians. So if you will, if you'll grab your Bible, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. You don't have a Bible at either of our campuses, there's one around you. If you're at our online campus, there's one right there on the screen for you. Ephesians is a book written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in Ephesus. And I love Ephesians because it's a pretty practical book. And I am a pretty practical fella. And in Ephesians 5, he's, he writes this, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So hopefully you've opened up to it. It starts out with this, look carefully. When Lamentation says test and examine your ways, it's saying this, look carefully. If you want two convicting words in this passage, look and carefully being combined into one phrase is absolutely convicting. This week I was thinking about it and I thought, I, I can look carefully at my job and tell you how I spent last week. I use an app to track my time. And so I can tell you I spent X amount of hours in meetings. And then I spent so many hours in sermon prep. I spent this amount of time with our staff. I can, I can give a detailed description. I can look carefully at my job and tell you how I spent my time last week. But my family, my personal life, we ate dinner together twice last week. The kids had some activities. We went to them. Laundry was moved from the dryer to the laundry couch. We did that. But looking carefully, I'm not sure I could, that would be a great description of what I could do in my own life. And what Paul is saying is examining our lives is vitally important if we wanna spend our lives on what is best. And one of the things that we will find as we examine our life is that it is filled with good but not best. It's filled with things that are shiny in front of us and the most pressing, it's filled with distractions. And if I want best over good, it's gonna be because I examine my life and find out the things that are distracting me. Minimizing distractions protects us from us and acts as a guardrail to keep us on the road we're supposed to be on. I don't know about you, I need protection from me. I am my own worst enemy. I can often just fill my space with whatever is an emergency in front of me, whatever I personally want to do in the moment, whatever I need, what I can fill my life with things about me pretty easily. And if I don't figure out how to minimize distractions, I won't ever be able to protect myself from me. But Paul goes on and he says, look carefully then. Say then. Then is a huge word in this. Because what Paul is doing is he's calling back to something that he wrote just a few verses before. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Paul says, hey, everybody, you can examine your life. You have the ability to look at your life and see the best way to walk 
You can look carefully making the best use of your time. You have that ability because you can be a child of light. And we recognize, we recognize physical darkness. If we don't turn off all the lights in here right now, which I'm not going to do because it would stress everybody out, you would feel the darkness. You, can, you recognize that you can't see what you need. You can't see necessarily even the person beside you. When your kid in the middle of the night wakes up and they're crying from another room and you're trying to, to navigate the minefield that is your house, don't step on a dog, don't step on the one single Lego that's in the middle of the room, don't hit the nightstand, we feel what darkness does. It, it lets us, it makes us feel like we just can't see. We don't know what's in front of us. We don't know how to navigate the road ahead of us. And what Paul writes in here is, hey, it doesn't have to be that way because of Jesus. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Listen, why settle for darkness when light is offered? And if we're gonna look carefully at our life and examine our ways so that we don't settle for good and we get the best that God offers us, it's gonna be because we recognize that I have the God who offers light and darkness, that I no longer have to be wondering how I should live my life because he says he will illuminate my life in a way that I can live it the way he has for me. That is what is offered to us so that we can look carefully how we walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of our time. The best use of this, this little amount that we have offered to us. The best. I love that word that Paul writes. And if we can get in the habit of looking carefully at our life, then we won't waste it. And we don't have enough to waste. And I'll be honest, in my own life, we'll let you in a Jeffrey counseling session right now. I'm so tired of settling for good when best is offered. And this week I was reading this passage and getting ready to preach and that look carefully just wrecked me all week long. Because I haven't always been good at that. So I spent some time doing that began to see areas in my life that I'd settled for good and not best. Areas of my life where I've just let distraction rule me. The days are evil enough without me being distracted all the time. If God offers best, that close, see how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. I love when Jesus is saying this. He doesn't say, hey, dummies, why are you so worried about your clothes? They don't matter. You know why? Because clothes matter. Think about how weird it would be in here if they didn't. <laughs> right? I would not feel comfortable. They matter. What we eat and drink, you know what? Turns out it matters. If we don't do it, we die. If we eat ramen in Little Caesars, we get fat. If all we drink is Kool-Aid, it's not great for us. Like it matters. Jesus doesn't say it doesn't matter. He just says, hey, why, why, are, you so, why are you so worried about those things? Why, why worry about your job? Why are you worried about your kid's second travel softball team? Why, why are you so worried about fitting in with that specific friend group? He doesn't say just your job doesn't matter. Your friendships don't matter. He doesn't say that. He just says, hey, don't worry about them. I, I got this. And when we go after the best that's found in Jesus, good follows it. When we let distractions pull us away from best, we settle for good. 
when we go after the best that's found in Jesus, when we seek him first, he says, and all those things will be added to you as well. Don't worry about what you eat or drink or wear. Not that they're not significant, but I got them. Seek me first and the good follows. But when we get this out of order and we seek good, we never find best. If we're making the best use of our time, it's because we are seeking Jesus first and trusting him with everything else. So how do we seek first? We could go to all the cliches. Put the big rocks in first. Make the main thing the main thing. Right? We could go to those things. You know why they're cliches? Because there's so much truth in them. How do we practically seek him first? By seeking him first, we will then eliminate distractions. So what does that look like? We eliminate distractions and seek him first by being at church regularly. And that can feel a little bit like, hey, come to my church. I'm employed by this place and I would like you to be here. This is not about Bellway. I love Bellway. I've been on staff 17 years. I love what we're doing here. I love what God's doing. I'm proud of our church. I'm proud of We Love Our City Week coming up. What we get to do with the food pantry and boots on the ground, the garage, ministry center. I'm proud of our church. I love being a part of it. This is not about Bellway. This is about church, the local body of Christ. What you don't know is on Sunday mornings, I'm walking around either the South Campus or the North Campus. And I'm praying for you that you would hear God. Because in the end, it doesn't matter what David or I ever say. It's just him. Throw out everything I say. If you hear him, what a win. I'm praying for you that you would hear him. Experience him in a new way. Praying for David that God would use him. Then, if you ever see me, I'll have my phone in my hand. And I'm not looking at Facebook. But I'm texting different pastors. My best friend Joel's a pastor in Colorado and text him every Sunday. There's a buddy of mine that's a pastor in Dallas. I text him. But then I'll text Wes Terry, who's the lead pastor at Broadview here in town. And I love Wes. And God's doing cool things at their church. They're growing. I text him, Wes, dude, I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of your church and what y'all are doing. Keep it up. Have a great Sunday. And I text Blake White, who leads Southside. Blake, dude. I've been hearing great things about what God's doing. Keep it up. Let the Holy Spirit, who leads Pioneer Drive, he's been a buddy of mine since college. John, you're his son doing what you're called to do. Just do it this morning. Have fun. Enjoy the presence of God. I text Austin Lawrence and J.R. Cochran, who lead the well. Fellas, y'all are killing it. I'm proud to get to be in this city, in this body of Christ with you. Because this is not about Beltway. We say for years, we've said around here, how many churches are there in Abilene? How many churches are there in Abilene? One. We want to chase after God together. I say this is a key point in eliminating distractions and seeking him first because I believe in the local church. Not just Beltway, I believe in Beltway. But I believe in what God does in this body. I believe we're better together. I believe something happens as we worship Something happens as we center ourselves on during the week, focused on him. Something happens in our kids' ministry. The vast majority of kids will come to Jesus before they turn 18. I love that my daughter is over there, not this service, she was first service, getting to know about God. She said yes to Jesus over there. I believe in what God does here and that it helps us focus and seek him first. And I love that even when you can't physically be here, that we have an online campus that I love and is vibrant and growing. There's something powerful that happens within the local church. We also eliminate distractions and seek him first by being in community. We were made to do life together. And I have men around me that one of their primary jobs is to help me eliminate distractions and seek him first by calling out the junk in my life. And this is gonna shock you. I got lots of junk that needs to be called out. So Todd Mitchell, who played the drums at the South Campus today, he's been my life group leader for a long time. Jordan Ziemer, who helped me. 
He's in my our life group. Noel Quartz is in my life group. Scott Burkhalter, they're in my life group. These are the men that I've surrounded myself with who when they see me out of line will call me back into line. That's community. That's what it's supposed to look like. And if we want to seek him first, like he said in, in Matthew 6, then that's gonna happen within community. You can always sign up for groups. This might feel like a weird time to sign up for groups on spring break weekend. Trust me, Than is in here right now. He would tell you, you can always sign up for groups. We seek him first and eliminate distractions by reading the Bible together, or reading the Bible. Listen, we often say this is a practical step for you. And I almost didn't put it on there, and then I felt the conviction of the Lord going, wait a second, reading the Bible, the Bible is God's holy word that he reveals himself to us. The Bible in his scripture is how he shows us his heart for us. It's how he shows us his heart for the world. It's how he reveals sin in our life and shows us hope and freedom and joy and peace. The Bible is the primary way that God is revealing himself to the world. Do you want to know him? He tells you. We want to eliminate distractions. He's outlining what a life looks like in his scripture. Yes, it feels like we, David and I say this all the time to read scripture, and that's true, and it is because of the power of God's holy word. Another one. We eliminate distractions, seek him first by praying. Do you know that for a long time, people like you and me did not get to just talk to God? It was reserved for the, the, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the faith in the Old Testament. And then Jesus. The high priest got to go in and then Jesus. And Jesus, death on the cross, opened up an avenue for us to talk to Almighty God. Think about that. God, who holds the world in his hands, who knows the amount of hairs on our heads, which for some of you is significant, for some of us less, that God, you can right now talk to him. And he listens. And what's crazy is he talks back. God up in the heavens listens to a buffoon like me. That is what we have in front of us. We can talk to him and that helps us keep us Online, especially when we pray like he tells us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We also eliminate distractions, seek him first by serving. We spent a few weeks uh, earlier this semester talking about serving and how we're more blessed when we give than when we receive. But I love talking about serving because if we really want our toes stepped on as we try to eliminate distractions, say yes to best and no to good, if that's what we want, and we start to serve, we're gonna be stuck in the place that we gotta say yes to what's best. If you come on a Sunday morning and you're gonna serve one service and you're gonna attend another service, guess what that means? You're probably gonna to have to wait at Chili's. You are. Maybe not the north side one, but for sure the south side one. It means that you're gonna miss the first half of the Cowboys game, which is a blessing, but you're gonna miss it means that you're going to get home at 12.30 instead of 10.30 sometimes. But what happens in those moments when we're having to get into the discipline of saying yes to his things and no to our things, it makes us choose. And to be frank, we're not great choosers. I can often choose what I want, and that is always good, but not best. You could take other spiritual disciplines too, like fasting. Fasting helps us live a life not distracted. Because when we fast, we're saying no to something we want. Maybe it's food, maybe it's social media, maybe it's caffeine. The best fast I've done in a long time was caffeine recently, because I adore caffeine. I don't like it, I love it. I love, co first cup of coffee in the morning is beautiful. Sonic Diet Coke, easy on the ice, is God's gift from heaven. And last year, Sarah and I were in a place that we really needed to hear the Lord. And we really needed him to speak to us and we needed him to move in our lives. So we both fasted. I can't remember what Sarah fasted. I fasted caffeine. So every time I thought about caffeine during the day, just under 90 times a day, I would go, God, I need you to move. I just need you to do it. I need to hear you. 
I need you to move in our life. Communion can be that way too. We're going to talk about communion more in a couple of weeks, but communion, we're remembering Jesus' death on the cross, helps us seek him first and not live distracted lives. And what's beautiful, as I read the words of Jesus in Matthew 6 and the words of Paul in Ephesians 5, about seeking him first and living a life where we're not distracted by everything the world might toss our way, what happens when we seek him first and he says all the good things come with him is a life that all of a sudden is filled with more peace than we had before. When I got best in him and not good in me, there's peace. When I have best in him and not good in me, there's joy and freedom and hope. Jesus said, and all these things will be added to them as well. And that's what we want. We want to take what we have and spend it wisely. I don't want to waste one second because I don't know how much I'll have. I hope it's more than 79 years. But I don't know. I want to spend everything that I have in the way that he calls me to in what's best and not good. So the question we have in front of us today is this. How am I spending my life? I think in all the times I've done sermon notes here, that's the first time I've put a whole sentence and it's because I just want you to sit in it. So write it down. Put your notes away. How are we spending our lives? Am I spending it on best and not good? Am I spending it seeking him first? I don't want to waste one moment. I want what he has. So if you will, if you'll bow your heads, just ask yourself that question. How are you spending your life? And as he reveals some things that maybe you're distracted by or as he reveals some things that maybe you've settled for, would you be bold enough to A, confess those to him, but then B, ask him for what he has, not what you have. And that's a hard prayer. God, wherever we're at in this place today, Give us the grace to hear your voice. Even as we were talking about praying a second ago, we get to hear you. God, would we hear you? Either campus, online, would we hear your voice? Would you show us areas? Would we, as we examine our life and test our life, as we look carefully at our life, would you show us areas where we're worried about what we eat or drink and wear, about our jobs and kids' activities, and we're worried about all these things? Would you show us areas that maybe we're not seeking you first? And then God, give us the boldness that only comes from your Holy Spirit to set those things aside and say yes to what you have. It's in your name we pray. Amen.